We ain't scared of nobody. We ain't scared of no damn body. Orange and blue skies, baby. New York stand up. New York stand up. Ain't nobody scared. It's the NBA playoffs, baby. I know the play-in games got something to do with it. They proceed the players. But damn it, the Knicks ain't in it, okay? The Knicks don't have to go through all that. Because we coming, that's why. We coming. I just built out my bagel and I don't give a damn. The Stephen A. Smith show in the house. <laughs> Next time, baby. Next time. Let's go. <laughs> What's up, everybody? What's going on, y'all? Welcome to the latest edition of the Stephen A. Smith Show. I know it's a Monday, all right? It's the start of a new week, but that ain't why I'm hyped, okay? That ain't why I'm hyped. I'll get to that in a minute. First of all, as always, we're here coming at you at the very minimum three days a week, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday over the digital airwaves of YouTube. Can't thank my subscribers and followers enough. We have already eclipsed 617,000 subscribers, picking up close to 3,000 subscribers over the week. We continue to climb. That would not happen if it were not the, for the love and support that y'all give me and my team. I thank y'all so much on behalf of the entire Stephen A. Smith show. And I ask you to keep the love coming. All right. And just remember, as always, while you're busy loving the show and following the show and subscribing to the show, make sure you pick up a copy of my New York Times bestselling book, Straight Shooter, a memoir of second chances and first takes. Now in paperback, by the way, just go to straightshooterbook.com. That's straightshooterbook.com. There's a lot of life lessons in there. It ain't a damn sports book, all right? It ain't a damn autobiography of me in the world of sports. It's about life, and I'm here to help in any way that I possibly can. Now let me get... To the NBA players, because there are a lot of stuff to talk about here. I'm going to get into Drake and, and, and how he came at Kendrick Lamar and Rick Ross and everybody else in between. I'm going to get into all of that. I'm going to get into our, pres our former president, Donald Trump, who is the first president in American history to be facing a criminal trial. Okay. This is what's going on in New York City today. But that's going to have to pale in comparison to what I'm going to start off this show with, all right? Because we're getting started with the NBA playoffs and an incredible end to the NBA regular season yesterday. All teams have now been seeded. 15 seeds have been decided. And the biggest playoff headline in my mind comes out of the Big Apple, baby. Comes out of the Big Apple. That's where the battle-tested New York Knicks managed to secure the number two seed overall in the Eastern Conference. The Knicks will face the first-round clash with either Miami, which ousted them last April in the second round, or Philadelphia, led by the one and only Joel B. Guess what, y'all? I don't give a shit. It don't matter. We ain't scared. We ain't scared. We ain't scared. We want them all. I I I'm trying to decide who I want more. Do I want Philly with Embiid since people think we can't take Embiid? Or do I want a vengeance exacted upon the Miami Heat? It don't matter. It don't matter. New York Knicks going to the conference finals. We going to take out whoever going to win Tuesday night. I'm sorry, Wednesday night between the Miami Heat and the Philadelphia 76ers. Whoever that team is, is going to be. It's going to face the New York Knicks in the first round, and they're going to get taken out. I don't scare, scared. I ain't scared. I understand we ain't got Julius Randle. We haven't had him since January 29th. I get all of that, all right? But let me throw some numbers by y'all because y'all need to pay attention to the kind of stuff that I'm talking about here. Even without Julius Randle, even with OG Ananobi injured for, for a chunk of that time, even with Mitchell Robinson in, in, injured during a chunk of that time, New York Knicks still ended up being the number two seed. How about that? How about that? Okay. And obviously, the biggest reason why would be for their top five league MVP candidate known as the one and only Jalen Brunson. Now, did you know that over the last 10 games, the brothers averaging 37.8 points per game on 40% shooting from threes with 8.3 assists? Did you know? Did you know? Did you know? I did. But over the last seven games, they're six and one. He's on a seven-game streak of scoring 30 or more game points in a game. He's averaging 38 points on 44% shooting from three, on 8.6 assists during the streak. And the New York Knicks ended the season on a five-game winning streak, winning 50 games and capturing a number two seed for the first time since 2013. This is what we talked about when we talked about the New York Knicks. Did you know that the New York Knicks with OG Ananobi is 20-3 and three in the lineup? Did you know that? Did you know that Dante DiVincenzo is launching more threes than anybody in the league outside of Steph Curry, and he's hitting those threes at about a 38% clip. Did you know that? 
Did you know that the New York Knicks didn't have either of them? Dante DiVincenzo nor OG Ananobi last year when they went up against Miami. So guess what? It's a different day. Now, I know how many hot cares is in Miami now, but he's a rookie, damn it. He's a rookie. We got to sit there and neutralize that. Jimmy Butler, I don't know how healthy he is. Bam out of bio ain't been himself. So I'm looking at the New York Knicks right now. Why can't they beat Miami? They can take them. They can take them. And the Philadelphia 76ers, I understand how unstoppable Joel Embiid is. Please don't get me wrong. I know this brother is otherworldly, but he ain't been healthy. He ain't been healthy. He just came back recently after the knee injury, and quite dare I say, he's looked a bit gimpy. So I'm looking at the New York Knicks right now, and I'm saying, bump Philly. Bump Miami. Let's go. Let's go. Now, I'm not going to get beside myself and tell you they're going to beat the Boston Celtics in the conference finals because I know better than that. But let me be very, very clear. I expect the New York Knicks to be in the conference finals because I expect them to beat Miami or Philadelphia in the first round. I'd say about six games. I'll be nice about it. I'll be nice about it. And then after that, they're going to go up against Milwaukee, maybe. But I think Indiana can beat Milwaukee. Let me be very, very clear about that. I think the Indiana Pacers could beat the Milwaukee Bucks because Giannis ain't healthy. And we don't know when Giannis is going to be back. And even though I got all the faith in the world in Dame Dollar, as in Damian Lillard, the reality is when I look at Milwaukee and I look at the way that they've struggled and I look at that 17-19 and 19 record with Doc Rivers, they haven't found themselves. And I don't think that Damian Lillard is happy in Milwaukee. He's got some personal issues. We wish him nothing but the best. Challenging family issues distract all of us. He's human. He's not immune to anything that we're not immune to. So I get all of that. But in the end, it's compromises, it has compromised the team. He's not the defender Drew Holiday was. Chris Middleton ain't the player he once was. Bobby Portis ain't being as aggressive offensively as he needs to be. There's no more Grayson Allen there. He's busy leading the league in three-point shots playing in Phoenix. And Connington and all of these other brothers ain't going to be enough. I think that Indiana, who's had their way with Milwaukee this season, is an unstoppable offensive force. They don't play enough defense, but how much defense do you have to play against Milwaukee? I think Indiana could take them. And then that would mean Indiana got to go up against the Knicks. And I assure you, that will not be good for them. It will not be good at all. So I'm looking at this right now, and I'm just declaring right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show, my Knicks are going to the conference finals. My Knicks are going to the conference final. I know it's hyperbole. I know it's emotion in some of y'all eyes. But damn it, we have suffered enough. It's our time. You lucky we don't have Julius Randle. You lucky we don't have Julius Randle. You lucky. Because if we had him, it might be, hell, I might be talking about finals. I might be talking about finals. I might be talking about, but that's right, I said it. This is time, y'all. We waited long enough. New York Knicks going to the conference finals. New York Knicks going to the conference finals. Transitioning, I wish I could say that about your Los Angeles Lakers. But I must say there's some intrigue involving the Lakers. Some compelling headlines with question marks, I might add, that make for very, very interesting times for a pundit and commentator such as, such as myself. Because we're going to head out to the Western Conference where the Lakers, having secured the eighth seed, are now destined for a playing matchup with the New Orleans Pelicans. They've had their way with the Pelicans. The in-season tournament, they annihilated them by 43 in the a, in a, in a semifinal game before beating Indiana in the championship game. They played them Sunday afternoon, smoked them again. I don't know what the hell is going on with Zion Williamson. Every time he sees LeBron James, it's like panic sets in. The man has increased the scoring average from December to January to February to March to April. And, the man, and then he runs into LeBron James and suddenly forgets how to play. I don't understand it for the life of me. It's like, it's like LeBron hypnotizes him or something. And, and, and the brother is just paralyzed. He can't do anything. He can't do anything right when he's going up against LeBron. It makes no sense to me. But that's neither here nor there. Because here's the storyline. If the Lakers win tomorrow night, as in Tuesday night, they're destined to face the Denver Nuggets, the reigning defending NBA champions, who, by the way, not only swept them in a regular season, but swept them in the Western Conference Finals last year. 
This is the what's been going on between the Lakers and the Denver Nuggets. The Denver Nuggets have had their way with them. And so we could talk about this. Did you know what did you notice what happened yesterday? The Lakers are running roughshod over the New Orleans Pelicans. LeBron James looks like the second coming of Magic Johnson. Throwing assists all over the place. Had 13 assists in the first half. Finished with like 28, 17, and 13. Phenomenal performance by King James. No doubt. Rui Hachimura dunking on people one minute. Catching alley-oops for layups another minute. Being fed by LeBron James. I mean, Austin Reeves just blossoming before our very eyes. Gabe Vincent is back in the lineup now. Was in Miami last year. Comes to the Lakers, a free agency. Doesn't play most of the season due to injury, but he's back in the lineup now. Okay? I brought up Rui Hachimura already, and Anthony Davis, balling, all-world player, all-NBA first team, Anthony Davis, who played 76 games this year. Phenomenal. I never thought. Lost my bet to Club Shay Shay Shannon Sharp. Lost my bet to him. I got to take his ass out to dinner tomorrow night in L.A. Because I lost my bet and I got to pay up. And he busy bragging about some dry steamed Wagyu beef that's for like 3200 bucks that he's going to order on my dime just because I lost the bet and he wanted to make me. See, this is the kind of stuff, this, 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 this kind of stuff I got to deal with here. That damn Shay Shay Shannon Sharp, I got to deal with his ass, okay? Because he told me that Anthony Davis was going to play more than 65 games to be eligible for these awards. And lo and behold, Anthony Davis picked this year all years to, to, to show up and play. Him and LeBron have played over 1,700 minutes together this season. More minutes than they to this season than they played together the last two seasons combined. But I digress. Here's the story. With all of that being said, here's the story. Listen to me and look at me and listen to me good. This dude, did you see how they were running away with the victory to, against New Orleans? And did you notice that at the same time, Denver, which had lost the game before, and Oklahoma City, which was in the process of blowing out Dallas last yesterday because they were all playing at the same time. When the game was out of hand, did you notice Anthony Davis came up with those back spasms? Ah, ah, oh. Remember, see, did you see him? You see him? Now, I don't know this to be true, and, 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 and I, I'm not accusing the brother of anything. I swear, I swear, I swear. But don't you find it a bit convenient that those back spasms kicked in the second he knew that all I got to do is win Tuesday night against New Orleans and Denver is our first round opponent. You think the Lakers did all of this to go home in the first round? You think they did that? Did you think they did that? Because ladies and gentlemen, you got to pay attention. The Lakers have a dilemma. And I'm going to throw this out to y'all. And please feel free to send in your questions to the Stephen A. Smith Show because I want to hear what you got to say about this. I'm asking you the damn question, America. I'm asking you the damn question. If you are the Los Angeles Lakers, do you go out there and beat up on New Orleans again and win that game, secure the seventh seed, and end up playing Denver in the first round of the playoffs? Or do you lose so you don't have to play them? Put yourself in a position where you're fighting for the eighth and final playoff spot with the winner of the nine and ten game between Golden State and Sacramento. Now, that's quite a dilemma. Because if you're the Los Angeles Lakers, you see, if you lose to New Orleans and you avoid Denver, you still not secure the spot in the postseason. That means you'd have to beat either Steph Curry or De'Aaron Fox and the Sacramento Kings team that swept you this year and has had their weight with you, who Anthony Davis is 0-10 against DeMontis Sabonis. He hasn't beaten the dude yet. Hasn't beaten the dude yet. And the one game that you'd have is against one of those two scenarios. Steph Curry, the greatest shooter God has ever created and a four-time champion, who's beaten LeBron James three times in an NBA Finals, I might add, or 
De'Aaron Fox and Sabonis and the Sacramento Kings who whipped your ass every time they went against you this year. Now, we all know we would never imply that the Lakers would lose on purpose. I mean, we would never think that the Lakers would run from the reigning defending NBA champions who've beaten them like the last eight or nine times. But when they just swept you in the Western Conference Finals and then followed that up by sweeping you during the regular season, I think it's safe to say y'all can't really beat them. And it ain't like it's the Western Conference Finals. It would be the first round. So the Los Angeles Lakers are in danger of going home in the first round. Because everybody knows that's the one team the Lakers presumably can't beat. But everybody else in the West is deemed very beatable by the Lakers in the eyes of aficionados every way, including myself. So what do you do if you're the Los Angeles Lakers? Does Anthony Davis' back spasms continue through Tuesday? Is LeBron going to get some food poisoning? Huh? Huh? I'm just asking. I'm just asking. Because I think it's a worthy, very worthy question myself. I think the Lakers going to go out there. They're going to show this rough side. They're going to go out there. They're going to beat up New Orleans again. That's what I think is going to happen. But I can't deny it. I ain't sure. I ain't sure that they're going to do that. Because going against Jokic and Jamal Murray, particularly together, is a very daunting task indeed. I just wanted to say that. Moving on, let's take a look at the top of the conference where we find the Oklahoma City Thunder, the team that went from winning 24 games two seasons ago to having the best record in the West. Led by SGA Shea Gilgis Alexander, the Thunder, the youngest team in NBA history to secure number one seed. They're one of the top two youngest teams in the league this year, y'all. They'll wait. They'll have to wait for the playing tournament's conclusion to learn their first round opponent. Okay? And it could be one of the four. Sacramento, Golden State, New Orleans, or the Los Angeles Lakers. None of that matters to me for this moment. Here's what matters to me. Ladies and gentlemen, the league MVP award should go to Shea Gilgis Alexander. I don't want to hear about Jokic. I want to hear it. I know he's great. I know he's a two-time league MVP. I know he's phenomenal. I get all of that. But I will repeat, the Oklahoma City Thunder are the second youngest team in the NBA. The Oklahoma City Thunder have the number one seed in the Western Conference. The Oklahoma City Thunder are led by this brother named Shea Gilgis Alexander, who averaged 30, 30. I ain't bring him no 10 game streak. I ain't bring him no, 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 seven game streak. This brother been doing it all season long. You know he scored over 30 and 50 plus games this year? Brother 25. Six, 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 seven guard. Led the league in steals. Tied for the NBA lead with Sacramento's De'Aaron Fox. This brother right here, 30.1 points per game. Third in the league behind Luka and Giannis. I'm just looking at this right now. 53.5% shooting from the field, career high, 6.2 assists per game. Shea Gilgis Alexander is the MVP. Not Jokic, not Luka, not even Jalen Brunson. It, it's, it's Shea Gilgis Alexander. Model of consistency and productivity that has led to the top overall seed and home court advantage throughout the Western Conference playoffs with the second youngest squad in the game. That is who we're talking about is Shea Gilgis Alexander. That's the story. He is the league MVP. He's getting my vote. I have a vote. He's getting my vote. He's getting my vote. Coming up, 
Much more on the NBA playoffs, including the Timberwolves and the Phoenix Suns out west, and of course, the Milwaukee Bucks in the east that I already alluded to. Plus, did y'all see what Boban did last night that had Clippers fans cheering for the opposing team? You don't want to miss that video. Trust me, you don't want to miss that. All that and jury selection is underway in Donald Trump's hush money case as he's the first president ever to stand trial in criminal court. All of that, plus Drake, Kendrick Lamar, and the crew, all of that and more ahead, right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back in a moment. It's that time of the year again, y'all. The NBA playoffs have finally arrived, and that means every basket, every rebound, every assist is important. And I don't know about y'all. But I need to be part of that action. So how do I do that exactly? I use Prize Picks, of course. You see, Prize Picks is the largest fantasy sports platform with more than three million members. Prize Picks is not only super exciting, but incredibly easy to play and takes only 60 seconds to make your picks. All you do is select two or more players from the sport you watch, whether it's the NBA, MLB, or even the PGA, and then choose more or less of their in-game stats. So if I know that Steph is dropping 30, LeBron is dishing out 10, and Jokic is pulling down 15 boards, I need to pick that and play to be rolling in the big-time money. So go to prizepicks.com and use promo code SAS for a 100% deposit bonus up to $100. That's right, go to prizepicks.com. Type in my initials SAS for a first-time deposit match up to $100. That's code SAS when you go to prizepicks.com. Pick more, pick less. It's really, really that easy. Trust me. Fans are getting excited here. There might potentially be some free chicken on the board if he misses the second free throw. Oh, man, free chicken on the board. Yeah, so that's why the fans are getting a little, little frothy. Oh, they're pointing to anything. And Bobo's playing with the crowd. Say, you want chicken? Here's your job. Oh, he gave him chicken. He's a man of the people. <laughs> He's a man of the people. He's a man of the people. Welcome back to the Stephen A. Smith Show right here over the digital airways of YouTube. That, ladies and gentlemen, was Boban Majanovic of the Houston Rockets intentionally missing a free throw in order to win free chicken for all of the Clippers fans in attendance. With Houston up 105-97 late, Boban stepped up to the line and missed his first free throw, which brought L.A. fans to their feet, of course, as a second missed free throw by a Rockets player in the fourth quarter would mean they would win free chicken as part of a promotion. Boban previously played two seasons with the Clippers from 2017 to 2019. First of all, this is all I have to say. If you know anything about Boban, you love him. You absolutely love him. He's in Philadelphia. He's in Dallas, in Houston, obviously Los Angeles Clippers. I have never met a single player in the NBA who doesn't exude and express nothing but love for this guy. The most, one of the most lovable people you'll ever meet in your life is kind-hearted as they come. Now, I loved him. He didn't look kind-hearted in, 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 in John Wick. I think it was uh, in number two or three. I mean, you know, he was trying to kill John Wick, you know, Keanu, played by Keanu Reeves. I, I didn't like that, all right? And ended up having literally a book used against him, you know, before he got his neck broken and stuff like that. But bottom line is, that's the only villainous role he's ever played. He's really a lovable guy, so it was really, really nice seeing that yesterday. And he was a man of the people. He's a man of the people. Great, great call. He wanted everybody to get some chicken. You know he wasn't jeopardizing the game. You understand? The outcome was, you know, it was decided. So he made sure to appease the fans that once cheered for him all the time because he was wearing a Clippers uniform. He found a way to appease them, too, while still not betraying his team and making sure he got the win. So we like that. Boban, way to go, brother. Way to go. Before I get back to the... NBA playoffs. I want to shine a light back on the women's game where the WNBA draft takes place tonight in Brooklyn, by the way. The draft features the biggest names in women's college hoops this past season. Y'all know who they are. Caitlin Clark, Cameron Brink, Carmela Cadosa, and Angel Reese, of course, just to name a few. But all eyes will be on Clark, who's expected to be the number one overall pick to the Indiana Fever. And the spotlight won't stop there for Clark and the Fever as the league announced 36 of their 40 games will be nationally televised or streamed. I can't blame the league for that. You got to hop on. You got you to play the hits and stick with what's working for you. And with the numbers that Caitlin Clark facilitated generating for women's college basketball this past off, this past season, remember, National Semifinal Final Four, or rather, before we even get into that, Elite Eight had over 12 million viewers. The Final Four had over 14. It peaked at 16 million. The National Championship game had over 19.7 million. 
This is women's college basketball generating these kind of numbers. It's because of Caitlin Clark, and we all know it's true. Now, Juju Watkins being on the court didn't hurt. Paige Beckett for UConn being on the court didn't hurt. South Carolina, led by Dawn Staley, certainly didn't hurt. But we all knew and know to this day who was the magnetizing figure. It was Caitlin Clark. And the question is, is that going to translate to the WNBA? I'm interested in seeing that. I have no doubt that will be the case initially. But with games being played in May, June, July, August, that kind of thing, it's going to be real interesting to see how dedicated and fixated on women's pro basketball folks are. Asia Wilson for the Las Vegas Aces is, is the queen of the sport right now. Diana Taurasi ain't retired yet. You look at UNESCO with the Liberty and her with her three-point shooting marksmanship and how she beat most of the fellas for crying out loud and losing to Steph Curry at All-Star Weekend. I got to give credit where credit is due. There's a lot of talent on the women's side, and it's incredibly compelling and appealing. Let's see if that continues and if Caitlin Clark is going to be able to up the ante to some degree because I got news for you. I am sickened at the thought that women's average salary is like or max salary is like 241000 The men's are at $10 million. And I want to state this for the record, and I've said this on many occasions, so I'm going to say it again. I blame the women. These women have been out there. They've been knew how to ball. They've been knew how to play. And Caitlin Clark coming onto the scene, she's just the latest. Everything else women's support ultimately thrives. So how come y'all ain't watching more women's basketball? Now, that seems to be changing. And I'm happy about that. But let it be clear. It could have been this way a long time ago if the ladies had stood up and supported women's sports. So let's see what y'all do. Now that Caitlin Clark's going to be in the league and Angel Reese is going to be in the league. And Cardosa and all of those other folks are going to be in the league. Joining those elite NBA players, WNBA players. And by the way, for the record, let us not get it twisted. I have been one of those people that have long said, if men can coach in women's sports, there should be a woman being allowed to coach in professional sports. For the men's. Now, I know the G League Coach of the Year is getting again the look, but I'm one of those people who believe Becky Hammonds for the Las Vegas Aces. I've been, I, I, I've been felt she should have been a coach in the NBA. So there ain't nobody throwing no shade on the women's sports here. I'm simply challenging the ladies out there to support the ladies more. Because as big as the NBA is, as big as the NFL is, and as big as college football is, it ain't just men supporting those sports. It's the ladies. That's how the sport got as big as it got. Because the ladies got behind them. Why, when y'all going to get behind the ladies? It's a legitimate question. Don't look at me like it ain't. You know. You know. Somebody got to say it, damn it, so I said it. Let me get back to the Western Conference playoffs and the, uh, the Minnesota Timberwolves and the Phoenix Suns. Now, I could be wrong because I have no clue which way to go. But I got to tell y'all something right now, in all honesty. I was on NBA Countdown on ABC Sunday afternoon. And when put on the spot, in a hushed, in a rushed moment, rather, I picked the Minnesota Timberwolves, the number three overall seed in the Western Conference, to beat the Phoenix Suns, who are the sixth seed. I'm changing my mind. I'm going with the Suns to win this series. Now, I'm fully aware that the New Look Suns never quite lived up to preseason expectations. But Phoenix has suffered a rash of injuries early in the season and underperformed even when the big three, Kevin Durant, Bradley Beal, and Devin Booker were healthy. But the bottom line is they avoided the playing game and now face the Timberwolves in the first round. And I'm just looking at some of these numbers, ladies and gentlemen, I, I got to admit to you, these are scary. So first of all, understand that Devin Booker and Kevin Durant are the only teammates to each average at least 27 points per game this season. I'm looking at the Timberwolves. They're 56 and 23 in the season, right? I'm just looking at them right now, and I'm just wondering about it. 
against, I'm sorry, 56 and 23 against 28 teams in the NBA, which is considered to be a remarkable turnaround. But they're 0-3 against the Suns this year. 0-3. Losses of 19, 18, and 10. They were up by 23 yesterday with three minutes to play before the Wolves bench closed with a 13-0 run to mask the final score. They were getting blown out, okay? Do y'all know that the Timberwolves have never been within single digits in the second half in any of those games? They've never been within single digits in the second half of any of those games. And I'm looking at that, and I'm saying to myself, excuse me, then I got to take into account you're the number one defense in terms of defensive efficiency in the, in, in the NBA. And I got to think about Rudy Gobert, who's in line to win another Defensive Player of the Year award. He's already got three. But this Rudy Gobert is the same Rudy Gobert that you can pull away from the basket, and he's a liability for you. That was one of the things that frustrated Donovan Mitchell and the folks in Utah when they were both in Utah. Well, now here they have here Rudy Gobert is. He's in Minnesota. And what are we talking about here? Against the Phoenix Suns, with Rudy Gobert on the floor, the Wolves have been outscored. By 25, 26, and 17 points in those three games where Rudy go be on the floor. He's a liability for them against Phoenix. Because in Kevin Durant, Devin Booker, and Bradley Beal, you don't have to go to the hole to score. You can shoot jump shots all day, every day. Ain't a damn thing they could do about it. I'm worried. I'm worried for Minnesota. I want to see Ant-Man advance. I want to see his star blossom. But it's a lot to ask. A team that sometimes is offensively challenged to go up against a Phoenix Suns team where they could score in their sleep. I'm very worried about this. Sun shot 49% from three-point range in the three-game season sweep of the Wolves. 49% from three-point range. Minnesota's 19 first-half turnover Sunday against the Suns tied an NBA record. 19 turnovers in the first half. Phoenix was 26-15 with the big three on the court. But what I'm thinking is that styles make fights and Minnesota's style of play doesn't bode well for them against Phoenix. Kevin Durant, Devin Booker, and Bradley Beal is something to behold offensively. Bradley Beal is relevant in the postseason for the first time in nearly a decade. Devin Booker is the modern-day Kobe as far as I'm concerned. Look at his game. Look at his mannerisms. It's just very, very similar. And Kevin Durant... It's KD, y'all. He's a two-time champion. He's a two-time NBA Finals MVP. And I don't want to hear this BS about how Kevin Durant is under more pressure come playoff time than, dare I say, somebody like a James Harden or somebody else. We'll get into all of that later on in this week because we're going to talk a lot of NBA this week. I'm just saying, y'all, I got to look at this for what it is and just articulate to y'all I'm very concerned about the Minnesota Timberwolves. I think Rudy Gobert's a liability. I got to go with the Suns. I got to go with the Suns. That's just the way it is. Let me get to this last item before I go to break. Because it's in regards to the Milwaukee Bucks again, who struggled late in the season. Milwaukee dropped to the third seed after losing to the Orlando Magic, which, by the way, is a team we all need to be paying attention to. The Bucs started this offseason with high expectations following that blockbuster trade for All-NBA guard Damian Lillard days before training camp. First-year coach Adrian Griffin started 30-13, and 13, but was dismissed midseason for Doc Rivers. The Bucs since are 17-19 and 19, since Rivers' coaching debut on January 29th, and now they're playing the high-scoring Indiana Pacers, who've beaten them in like four to five meetings they've had. I do not believe that Doc Rivers will get fired if they lose this series, particularly with Giannis Antetokounmpo hurt um, and Damian Lillard having some of the issues that he's had on a personal basis, which is none of anybody's business. But he's had some family issues, and, it's, and you're in a new city, and you don't have the support base you once had in Portland. Um, it's a lot. And I think we're seeing that it's a lot for him to handle. Having said all of that, I'm going to reiter reiterate what I said when Doc Rivers first got the job in Milwaukee. I don't think he'll get he'll suffer the consequences of any subpar play or anything like that this season. 
But if Doc Rivers doesn't get to the finals or win the chip next year, I think this will be Doc Rivers' last head coaching job in the NBA. He's been coaching now close to 25 years as a head coach. He's had ample time. He's got one title. He's got two trips to the NBA Finals. Um, he's had multiple Game 7 losses, particularly up 3-1 and then losing Game 7s. Um, none of this bodes well for him. I love Doc Rivers. I think he's a damn good coach. But in the end, you do have people begging him to pull out his bag and show them something new because they think he's been figured out. We'll find out whether or not that's true or not. But I wouldn't be surprised at all if Indiana beats Milwaukee. I really, really wouldn't. I'm sorry, I just feel that way. And when I think about Doc Rivers, I think that's going to be very bad for him. Here's what I also think the Milwaukee Bucks should be considering. And I've said this on TV, but I'm going to say it here for the purposes of this podcast. I think if things don't work out, I think if there's a way to unload his contract, I really, really believe that Damian Lillard should be traded. I'm not saying that because of Damian Lillard, the player. I believe in the brother. I believe the brother's big time. And I believe that he'll find a way to get done what he needs to get done. But I also firmly believe that he's miserable. I don't think he's happy at all. And I think that when you look at Damian Lillard, that matters. It really, really does. Because you need Damian Lillard, you know, to be Damian Lillard. I'm just looking at his numbers right now. Damian Lillard is getting paid $45.6 million this year. That number elevates to 48.7 next year. Then in 2025-26, it elevates to $58.5 million. And then he has a player option at $63.2 million. So we understand what's going on. It's very, very difficult to get somebody else to want to absorb that contract of Damian Lillard. But what I would surmise to anybody is that, yeah, he was willing to leave Portland. But he wanted to be in Miami. You don't want to be in Miami, but you okay with Milwaukee. Let's just say it's two different, completely different worlds. Just trust me on this. Trust me on this. Milwaukee is not Miami. I had to do an event there just a couple of weeks ago with Thanasis and Giannis. It was damn near blizzard. Three days later, I was in Miami. It was damn near 90 degrees. It's a different world. It's a different world. You don't aspire to go to Miami and you're okay in Milwaukee. You feel me? You feel me? You feel me? I'm just telling you. So you have to take those things into consideration and draw the conclusion that maybe, just maybe, as an organization, we support Dame. We know that Dame is a terrific player. We win when he's on the court. We lose when he's not. This brother can explode at any moment. He's big time. Dame Dollar, the closer. But you, 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 you got to look in the mirror and ask yourself, can I make somebody happy? And sometimes you got to really, really recognize when you can't. And I think that's what Milwaukee should be doing when it comes to Damian Lillard. And try to get him someplace. Dare I say that he'll be happier. I think it's something that should be strongly considered, especially if Indiana bounces them out in the first round. You heard me say it. I just said it again. Coming up, former President Donald Trump heads to court as the first president ever to face criminal charges. 
We'll talk about all that. Plus, there's a final, there's finally rather a response from Drake in the Kendrick Lamar rap beef. And you might as well call it Drake versus everybody. I mean, everybody. I mean, everybody. everybody. That's next, right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show over the digital airwaves of YouTube. Don't go anywhere. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Stephen A. Smith Show right here over the digital airwaves of YouTube. Moving on. The NBA wasn't the only place battles were taking place this weekend. The ongoing beef between Kendrick Lamar, J. Cole, and Drake had social media buzzing yet again, with Drake finally responding to Lamar's diss track like that, with not one, but two of his own. The first was a leaked snippet called Drop and Give Me 50. Fans speculated the title refers to rumors of Kendrick Lamar having to give 50% of his album sales to his former label. Drake referenced Kendrick's stature, calling him a pipsqueak. The surprise drop had fans wondering if it was real or a work of artificial intelligence. Hours later, another version was, was released with the same lyrics but a different beat. While it is unclear as to why, what is clear is that it is Drake versus everybody as he took shots at rappers Future, ASAP Rocky, The Weeknd, and Rick Ross, who obviously responded immediately with a diss of his own called Champagne Memories. I know that there's a lot of folks out there, particularly in the black community, that are appalled by this. Their, atti their attitude is, is black on black. I mean, damn, can't we all just get along? Stealing lines from Rodney King. I get it. I understand it. But to me, hip-hop was based on battling. I mean, one of the best scenes we've seen was if you remember when 8 Mile with Eminem was going on and Eminem was going up against, you know, all of those rappers on stage to culminate the movie. We love it. I know something about you. You went to Cranbrook. That's a private school. What's the matter, dog? You embarrassed? This guy's a gangster. His real name's Clarence. I mean, you see it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, come on now. That's what comes with it. You know, Snoop Dogg got a boob job. Remember that? It happens. I Again, I don't know how many times I got to tell y'all. I grew up, Hollis Queens, Run DMC, LL Cool J, Five Minutes Away, Farmers Boulevard. You know, Cool Mo D, KRS-One, Eric B and Rakim, Nas, of course, everybody. We saw all of this. In the years and years to follow, Cannabis tried to come into the mix. LL is just, he's timeless. We'd see Tupac, we'd see Biggie. We didn't want East West Coast beef, not like that. We saw what that could materialize into. Two legends, gone, but never forgotten, and Biggie and Tupac. But cats just going at each other lyrically, it's, it's, it's no harm. It's no harm. This is what it's about. And I knew Drake was going to be solid because he saw the heat that J. Cole took for reversing course and feeling bad about coming at Kendrick Lamar. And that ain't what Drake is made of. Not knocking J. Cole in any way, but that ain't Drake. And you know Rick Ross ain't going to go out like that. Now, again, if you got a fly beat to it and it's good music and you, you show your skills as a lyricist and folks are feeling it, as long as nobody gets harmed because of it, I'm good. I'm good. I would expect no less from Drake. Drake, Drake couldn't just sit idly by and say nothing. He couldn't do that. That would hurt his rap. He ain't having that. You know, being a good-looking, light, good light-skinned brother from Canada who most of the industry felt at one time or another didn't even belong in the industry until you had to show them your skills. He going to back down from a battle like that? that Drake's not doing that. Drake's not doing that. He's too big time to do that. And it's going to be interesting to see what, what, what Rick Ross comes back with. It's going to be interesting to see. Because I'm, I'm just saying, this is, what, this is what we like to see. As long as it stays in the lane that it's in. No violence. No violence. It's just one trying to show they're a better lyricist than the other. As long as that's the case, hell, Nas and Jay-Z went at it before. 
As long as it stays in that lane and everybody getting paid, we good. I'm a capitalist. It fuels the economy. The more people who get paid, the merrier. Think about that. Think about that. One has nothing to do with the other, but when you see folks complaining and bitching and moaning and going crazy about open borders, what are they really complaining about? They're really complaining about whether or not it's compromised job opportunities for other groups of people. They're really complaining about people walking across the borders and ultimately being illegal, not being documented, therefore not being compelled to pay taxes and stuff like that, using our medical resources and what have you, hospitals, emergency rooms, et cetera, et cetera, what ultimately leads to the American taxpayer funding some of this stuff. And every time we turn around and whether it's the economy, it's inflation, it's, uh, 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 you know, unemployment rates or anything like that. You look at stuff like that and say, wait a damn minute. I'm paying all of this. You coming to me, charging me more money. And we got folks flooding our borders. Why do I bring something like that up? Because what I'm trying to say is in a roundabout way, if folks are getting paid and folks are paying taxes and everybody's fueling the system, we're all good because we don't feel unsafe or that our quality of life is being compromised. So we should always support folks making money legally, not causing harm to other people. If you're not causing harm to other people, particularly of the physical variety, and you're getting paid, and everybody's fattening their bank accounts and their wallets. It works for all of us. It works for all of us. And I view any industry like that, including the hip hop industry. That's just me. That's just me. Before I get on out of here, I want to touch on this last subject right here because it involves the world of politics. You know, I don't know if you noticed or not, but jury selection began today in the New York courtroom where former President Donald Trump is fighting 34 felony charges. The counts alleged Trump falsified business records to cover up a $130,000 hush money payment to porn star Stormy Daniels in a run-up to the 2016 presidential election. If convicted, the charges could land the presumptive Republican presidential nominee in prison. Prosecutors alleged Trump reimbursed his former lawyer, Michael Cohen, for the payment falsely labeling the checks as legal services and concealing a federal law, federal election law viol violation. Of course, Trump has pleaded not guilty to the charges. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a disaster. Somebody needs to tell you, so I'm going to tell you. And I got liberals working for me who will remain nameless, you know, working on my staff and stuff like that. But without looking at them, I'm going to plead to them to understand where I'm coming from. I want to emphasize that I'm not absolving Trump from anything. I'm not trying to paint him as some good guy who's being victimized. That's not what this is about. What this is about is the end game and people not willing to see the forest from the trees, understanding the damage that can ultimately be caused. You want Trump gone, beat him. Beat him. Period. Didn't Roe v. Wade get overturned? Isn't there millions upon millions of women out there who are diametrically opposed to that decision? Wasn't it Trump initially bragging, the one that was bragging about how he was responsible for the overturning of Roe v. Wade before the GOP got up in him? And said, stop saying that. You might cost yourself the election because you got a whole bunch of women out there that are appalled by that decision. And then he reversed course. Not completely with Roe v. Wade. But in terms of the amount of time that should be allowed before you're allowed to have an abortion. Or the amount of time that should, that should, that should span. Before you can ultimately cut off the possibility of being able to have an abortion. These are the kind of things that Trump has been involved with. You've got that going on. You've got an economy that the, the Democrats want to say is thriving. We've got an inflation issue that they say is not really an issue. You're just miscalculating what's really transpiring. 
We've got an unemployment rate worthy of being stomached. It's not bloated. What's the problem? Do you know what you're putting yourself, what kind of position you're putting yourself in if you're the Democrats? Listen to me, my liberal fe fellas and ladies. Listen to me. Did it ever occur to you that Iran dropping bombs or trying to drop bombs or send drones and missiles and all of this stuff to Israel could potentially be deemed as a bad look by the United States? China issues, Russia invading Ukraine, border issues here in the states, Texas, Florida, California, violence in the streets, a New York, L.A. folks committing crimes and they out of jail the same day. Is it possible that it could be perceived that you're going after Trump using lawfare? Because you can't beat them because, you know, the issues don't favor you. Is that possible? Is that possible? Because, see, that's the argument he's going to make. And why am I bringing something like this up? Well, let's count the ways. So basically, we're going to encapsulate Trump's issue this way, ladies and gentlemen. Look at me, Sherry. I'm talking to, I'm talking to my peeps here. Look at me, Galen. Look at me, Michael. Griff, just because you shaved your beard and you no longer look like a caveman don't mean you're going to get away with ignoring me. Listen to me right now. Do you think when you bring up these issues and you say 34 charges, don't you think it's trying, it's sort of diminished the moment you say it's hush money for a porn star? So let me get this straight. The 45th president of the United States, who's no longer the president of the United States at this particular moment, is being, is in a courtroom today, eight years after he was originally elected, because he facilitated hush money to a porn star. So in other words, I screwed around with a porn star and I didn't want nobody to know. Y'all don't remember Gary Hart and some of the lies he was willing to tell? He wasn't the only one. Y'all remember Bill Clinton? I have never had sexual relations with that woman. Y'all remember that? Lying under oath. Remember that? No sexual relations. Who was the, uh, who was the, who was the presidential candidate? Edwards? John Edwards? Remember the lies that he told? You really, really, really going to push this where a state like New York has a former president in a courtroom because he paid $130,000 in hush money through an intermediary who happened to be his lawyer, Michael Cohen, to keep a porn star's mouth shut about the fact that they got loose with each other because he didn't want that to taint his campaign. That's what we're going to do. We're going to have people in court because they lied about stuff when they were campaigning for higher office, knowing that it could derail their campaign. Now, I'm not getting into the legal lease of it all. I understand from a legal perspective, the law is the law is the law. And if you're a libertarian, it's about the law. Did I tell y'all that story about Bill Clinton? I never had sexual relations with that woman, Monica Lewinsky. Did I tell y'all that story? A dear friend of mine at the time was working in the newspaper industry and I was working for the Philadelphia Inquirer. And I said, the dude had a sexual encounter with the intern that was Monica Lewinsky. Do you know what this woman said to me? Oh my God, Stephen! He did it in the Oval Office. I said, what? It's the Oval Office. The sanctity of the office. Mm. 
Wasn't John F. Kennedy? Was John F. Kennedy in that office? Wasn't Marilyn Monroe alive then? Mr. President. She wasn't there? Never showed up White House. Even if she didn't. Jackie Kennedy was a good looking woman. They just went upstairs, honey. They never did anything in the Oval Office. Ever. Never had. Never died. Never died. None of these presidents? I mean, I don't know the answer to this question. It's just rhetorical questions. It's JFK, is Lyndon B. Johnson, is is Richard Nixon, is is is, is Gerald Ford, is Jimmy Carter, is Ronald Reagan, is H. W. Bush, and then Clinton, and then George W. Bush, and then Barack Obama. I think Michelle Obama is the greatest first lady that ever lived. I can't speak for white people. To black men, you see that woman? You see that woman? Now, I'm not speaking out of turn. They're married, happily married all of these years, two beautiful kids. If I have the Oval Office available to me and that's my wife, I got to wait till I get upstairs. See, we got to be human beings. Somebody got to say it. Somebody say it. We got to be human beings. Okay? And people who work for me who will remain nameless, I got some freaks working for me, okay? Happily married, but freaks nevertheless. Don't tell me every move you made was in the bedroom. Don't tell me the living room and the kitchen and the backyard and, and the basement was not stuck. The car, the truck. Don't tell me that these available spaces weren't utilized to your advantage. And you got the Oval Office available to you, and suddenly you, you, you're not supposed to utilize it. You talk about power tripping, you talk about ego. Think about that for a second. I'm not going to get loose in the Oval Office once. Steven, he did it in the Oval Office. This woman was not playing. She was dead serious when she said that to me. And I said, oh, my God. People like this really do exist. It's insane. That's how ridiculous it seems right now. When Bill Clinton, just to articulate my level of consistency, because I want to make sure everybody knows. When I was around during the whole Bill Clinton, Monica Lewinsky thing, I never held against him, him lying about having sexual relations with that woman. Do you know why? I lied to my wife. What the hell I care about y'all for? I'm worried about her. I'm worried about Hillary. I ain't worried about y'all. That's why. That's why. Remember, he was reelected. He was still going to be able to serve his time. All that effort he was putting forth, if I remember correctly, was to keep it from Hillary. It wasn't the, the public. He already in office. It was to keep it from Hillary. That's who you wanted to keep it from. Because I assure you, every married man I know that has transgressed is significantly more concerned about the wrath from their woman than they are about public opinion. When it comes to sex... That's the truth. So all I want to say is he got with a porn star and tried to hide it while he was campaigning for the highest office in the land. And that's y'all case. It's much ado about nothing. 
to my liberal friends out there, all you're doing is showing that you're scared you can't beat them on the issues and the merits. That's why he keeps saying it's a political campaign against me. That's why he keeps saying they can't beat me at the election, at the polls. This is the only way they could do it. And if you don't put him in jail and he still goes from being a presumptive GOP nominee to the official GOP nominee and he goes to the polls, even though he was going to whine about winning and being, being rigged again, you have given more fodder to that argument. Which means we'll never have peace in this country because tens of millions of people see what extent the other side is willing to go through just to keep him out of office because they can't beat him on their own merits. And they're going to say, hey, you trumped this up against him again. And we'll have no peace when all you got to do is figure out a way to beat him on the issues. But you haven't been able to do it. What a damn shame. I was only joking when I said on first take this morning, I'm considering the voting for a third party because that would throw away my vote. But I, w I do mean it when I say this. If I did it, which I won't, but if I did it, you deserve it. You can't beat them. Everything you do shows me you can't beat them. It's a damn shame. It really, really is. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. In jail because of a porn star. In court, rather, because of a porn star. 500 people being screened and questioned to see if they could become members of a jury because a former president tried to keep quiet about the fact that he was getting loose with a porn star. As an aside, I have heard good things about Stormy Daniels. I mean, I don't know anything myself. I never looked. I never looked. I never looked. But I'm just saying, you know, I would think that we could do better. It's a damn shame that we can't. It's a damn shame that we can't. Before I get on out of here, let's go to some tweets before I end the show today. Uh, first one. Um, is uh, at Greg 1667-6935-420. What's the smallest amount of money you would reach into a toilet to get? Into a toilet? Well, if it's a toilet with clear water, $100, something like that. If it's shit in there, poop. I mean, it would have to be more than that. But I will say this, if it's mine, I'll get over it. If it's somebody else's poop, I don't know how much amount of money I'm willing to do that. I can't recover from that. I'm just sorry. That's just how I roll. I don't know about that one. Next tweet, please. Put it up. Let's see here. Um, at Oh My Diaz writes, Jedi in Star Wars or a wizard in Harry Potter? Harry Potter is where I would go because that broomstick can have me flying. And that's good enough for me. I'm not familiar with the Jedi and Star Wars other than that sword. I know it can kill people, cut them half all that stuff, but can you fly? I don't know about that. I would go with Harry Potter. That would just be me. Next tweet, please. Put it up right there so I can take a look at it. Thank you very, very much. Um, at TTV, oh nah, I'm ghost. Good morning, Stephen A. Who you got in a one-on-one? -on -one? First to ten. Miles Morales or Perfect Cell? I'm going to go with Miles Morales. He looks like he could ball. Perfect Cell looks like he got speed, but I don't know if he could ball. I'm going to go with Miles Morales. That's what I'm going to do. Next tweet up, please. Put it up there. Put it up there. Okay? This is the last one here. At Ben Affleck. Not Ben, but Ben. B-I-N Affleck. Biggest red flag in a romantic relationship. <sighs> Biggest red flag.
for a man, the biggest red flag with your woman should be when she don't really care whether she giving you some or not. Like if she can go without and she don't mind and she doesn't seem to have any hunger for you whatsoever, one or two things are going on. She got somebody else or she's just not into you. So she's going, she's about to go get somebody else because she need what she need and she want what she want. And when you that dude, she want it from you. And when you not that dude, eh, that's the biggest red flag for a dude. The biggest red flag for a woman should be two parts. When he doesn't care whether or not he's around you, he can take you or leave you in terms of time spent with him. All right? That's one point. The other point is when he doesn't care to know who you're around. All right, this is whatever. Baby, I'm going out. All right, have a good time. He ain't ask you who with. He ain't ask you what time you getting back. None of that matters to him. Now, don't get me wrong. Some dudes are just weak as hell and they controlling and stuff like that. Any man that's controlling, that, 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 that wants to control his woman, he ain't no real dude because what happens is he's scared of competition. Even though there shouldn't really be competition, he's really petrified of it because he's got his own insecurities. And that dude is not somebody you should want. The flip side to it, however, is that you're not being controlling if your woman sits up there and says she's going out, but she don't tell you with who and she don't tell you where and when she's getting the hell back. She's just out there and you never ask, nor do you care. Or she doesn't tell you. Like when a woman's like, Sherry, speak up, girl. Nod your head if I'm right. When a woman is feeling you, fellas, listen to me. The fellas know I'm right about this. Real dudes. I'm not talking about virgins who don't know no better. Breath, breath smell like Similac wet behind the ears. I'm not talking about novices. I'm talking about brothers who know. And when I say brothers, I'm talking about Latino, white, black. Man, we all in this together, all right? Fellas, stand up if you know I'm right. When a woman is feeling you, when she is loving on you, you don't have to ask her. She tells you, hey, baby, I'm, I'm, I'm going out. I'm going out with my girls. I'll be back in a while. You know, we going out. We hanging out, blah, blah, blah. I'll see you later. I'll probably be back later on the night around. She might not give you like specific time because she don't want to be married to it. But she lets you know. It's like, yo, we going, we going out here. We doing this. We doing that. I'll see you later. Love you. You going to be home later when I get back? Okay, baby. Bye-bye. Something like that. She's doing that. When she's feeling you, you get those details without asking. When you have to ask, there's a problem. There's a problem. I hope I answered y'all question. I'm about to get on out of here. I hope y'all enjoyed this edition of the Stephen A. Smith Show coming at you over the digital airways of YouTube. It's NF NBA playoffs. We the playing game tomorrow night. LeBron and the Lakers going up against Zion and the Pelicans. The nightcap with the Warriors in Sacramento going up against the Aaron Fox. And then Wednesday, you've got Philly and Miami. And then after that, Chicago and Atlanta. And by that time, Come Friday night, the seedings will be firmly decided, one through eight in both conferences, and the NBA players will officially begin. I'll be all over it right here on these airways. I'll make sure I'm going to have some guests. I'm going to bring some of my peeps inside. Some of y'all need to see some of my homeboys. Y'all need to see some of my homeboys, some of my homegirls that I hang with, that I vibe with. You're going to see them on the show, too. All of that and more is coming up. By the way, also remember, tomorrow is a special edition of the Stephen A. Smith Show. Earn your leisure, the fellas. From Earn Your Leisure podcast, financial excellence and expertise, financial influencers, 
big time in the YouTube and, 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 and streaming and digital space. They will be live in studio with yours truly right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show on, on YouTube. Make sure you don't miss it. Until then, ladies and gentlemen, I'll talk to you. Peace and love, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day.